Hello and welcome to today's European SharePoint and Office 365 Community Webinar. My name is Shane and I'm delighted to be joined by Sebastian Levert, who will be talking to you about Introduction to Angular JS with the Microsoft Graph. Remember to join in the conversation about today's webinar on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at EuropeanSP and our hashtag is ESPC16. After the webinar, we will have a questions and answers session. Type any questions you have for Sebastian in the questions window. Some questions will be selected and answered at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and you will be notified by email when it is available. And now I'm going to pass you over to our webinar presenter, Sebastian Levert. Hello, Sebastian. Hi, Sebastian. Hello, Sorry. Hello. Hey. No problem. Um, nice, uh, nice to uh, join you today uh, to talk about a subject that is very um, important to me, and it's how we can develop with modern techniques in the uh, Office 365 world. So um, I have a bit of slides, uh, but I especially want to show you lots of demos. So um, let's start it off um, by introducing you to the AngularJS and the Microsoft Graph world. So uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. Um, I am Sebastien Lavaire. I am uh, from Montreal, Canada, so I'm currently live in Montreal. Um, so it's early in the morning, so uh, it's, uh, it's always funny to, to be awake up at this time. But uh, I'm working for a company called Tutulid. Tutulid is a uh, generous consulting company based in Toronto uh, that are developing awesome solutions based on the Angular uh, framework, Office 365, Microsoft Graph, SharePoint, and SharePoint Online. Um, I am an Office Servers and Services MVP. Uh, mainly focusing on everything around development and PowerShell on the Office 65 platform. But my background is mainly a, uh, a web developer. So I am um, focusing all my development efforts on the web side of things. You can follow me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at Sebastian Lavaire and on my blog at SebastianLavaire.com. So today we're going to cover, um, I would say, four main topics. The first one is what AngularJS and why should I use it? The second one will be what is the Microsoft Graph? The third one will be what is an Azure AD application? And then we're going to deep dive into the different demos. So if you are ready, I'm ready. Uh, so let's kick it. So what is um, AngularJS and why should I care or why should I use it? Um, AngularJS is for me a technology that is uh, very important in, in 2016. We, uh, as, a, as a developer community, we, we hear a lot about that JavaScript framework thing. And everyone is trying to push us to do more JavaScript. Being a SharePoint developer, uh, uh, you, you need to understand that you, you're current workflow or your day-to-day -day workflow, if you're still using SharePoint on-premises with full trust solution, you need to move to a more client-side dish side of um, the, the web development. And AngularJS is probably the one that will be able to help you in leveraging uh, good code quality, performance, and um, good solutions. So AngularJS, what it is? It is, in fact, what they call a super heroic JavaScript MVW framework. Um, we're all used to MVC, MVVM, or MVP types of applications, which are ways for us to uh, separate our code between different components. For MVC, it would be model, view, and controllers. For MVVM, is model, view, and view model. Or for MVP, it's model, view, presenter. In the case of AngularJS, it is a MVW framework. So it means that it's an MV, so a model view, whatever framework. So you can build whatever you want. 
So you can build it in a MVC pattern, in an MVP pattern, or in an MV double, MVVMW pattern, which leaves you the choice. And especially, you can bring your own knowledge, you can bring your own skills in that AngularJS framework. Angular is a uh, JavaScript framework that is developed by Google um, that was started in 2009. We are today, um, and more than ever, um, surrounded by apps um, that are built in AngularJS. So I've built tons of apps in the enterprise space, now fo focusing only on AngularJS. So this is very cool. Uh, but the big brands are also using uh, AngularJS. So Netflix is based on AngularJS. YouTube, Vivo, MSNBC. Um, there, there are like I would say uh, more than five percent of all the web that is not powered by AngularJS, and all the big brands are starting to uh, to use it. So it means that there's a, there's a traction, there's a commitment from the community to use that framework, and it will stay there for a very long time. For me. This framework, this framework was clearly a game changer in web development. Um, when AngularJS came in, um, it, it was it, no, nobody was really doing JavaScript the way AngularJS was doing it. And now I don't think anyone would go away from that kind of mindset. Maybe AngularJS is not the, the exact right framework for you, but lots of frameworks are there that are um, inspired by AngularJS, or at least the paradigms that exist um, under AngularJS. And then we have that Angular 2 that is coming. Uh, initially, it was announced for 2015. Now we're halfway into 2016. We're still in release candidates for Angular 2. Um, it should be out this year. Angular 2 um, is a complete rewrite of AngularJS. Um, so it's important to know that both framework will exist and will coexist for a certain amount of time. Um, there is path to migrate from Angular 1 to Angular 2. Um, those paths are not the easiest paths for now. Um, so today the session will mainly be on Angular 1.5, I think, but AngularJS, so the most recent version of uh, AngularJS. But everything you will learn today will be will you'll be able to apply it in the Angular 2.0 pattern. Especially, I will show you at the end uh, an example of an app running Angular 2 and connecting to the Microsoft Graph. So you will be able to um, leverage the knowledge you, uh, you'll build in Angular for Angular 2 uh, reasons. Um, so why do you, should, should I use AngularJS? If you are a SharePoint developer like I was, um, there's only good reasons to go towards uh, AngularJS. The first one is you want to get closer to client-side development. You want to stop writing server-side code, or at least you want to stop writing SharePoint server-side code. If you ever used or uh, built applications with um, Office, on, uh, Office Online or SharePoint Online or the Office 365 platform, you know that it's kind of hard to be able to provide uh, server-side code in there. Uh, there are ways you, know, you can use Azure that connects remotely to your environments, but it, it, it is not built in the, the environment. So what if you want to simplify your development process and always use the exact same knowledge in on-prem and online scenarios? Um, Client-side development is one of the best way to do it. So you only need JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. Try to find a way to package that and be able to deploy it in the um, different environments you want to use it, uh, which leads you to be able to always be a cloud-first solution, but because uh, SharePoint on-premises is also using APIs, you will be able to call them from your JavaScript files. It will also help you start thinking like a web developer and not like a SharePoint developer. And this is something very important. In, in those years today where you will learn tons of new tools, you will learn um, JavaScript as your main tool, but there's a ton of tools around JavaScript that will make your development workflow easier. Um, you can think of Node.js. You can think of um, Gulp to be able to uh, do some task running in your own builds in, in, in the web environment. Um, so it will help you and start thinking like a web developer and start learning those tools that are around 
um, the Angular ecosystem. Also because you'll, you, you'll have to be living on the edge. You'll have to uh, learn new things and you'll have to apply them in your day-to-day -day life. Um, one of the reasons why I, I initially went into the AngularJS platform is because I wanted to learn. And then I figured out that this learning experience was giving me new skills and new uh, knowledge that I was able to apply immediately in any project I had. So um, by living on the edge and learning new stuff, you will be able to um, apply these new technologies and those new techniques to your day-to-day -day, uh, development life. You will also use AngularJS because you love building application faster with, with, with less code. Um, it is crazy how many lines of code you will save with an AngularJS application um, and how many server-side code you will, you will save because you won't write any. You will use APIs. And this is the way that Microsoft wants us to use their services now. Everything is API-driven. We'll talk today about the Microsoft Graph and what is that huge API around the graph. It's crazy how it helps you in leveraging uh, your Office 365 data from an AngularJS standpoint. And also because everyone is heading towards it. Everyone is there. Everyone wants to use AngularJS. Um, even Microsoft. Microsoft is using AngularJS and other uh, JavaScript frameworks to help their, their development process. So if you go on the uh, dev.office.com, which is your new favorite uh, homepage for your uh, favorite browser, uh, on the dev.office.com you will find tons of AngularJS simple applications that you can use to connect to anything around the Office platform. So to run it inside an Excel add-in or in a Word add-in or even connecting uh, in SharePoint Online or even on the uh, Microsoft Graph. So you should go AngularJS, Angular or AngularJS, Angular 2, no matter what, but you should go uh, that way if you want to have uh, a, um, a successful development story from now on. Angular is still very trendy. Uh, here you can see, um, and this is uh, stats from, uh, I would say, around June, uh, May or June uh, 2016, well, you can see the trends in Google. So you can see that there's a, uh, a fair amount of trend around the React framework, uh, which is built by Facebook. But we, we still have a lot and a lot of traction around AngularJS. And you can see that Angular 2 is not picking up. Um, and this is how Google will uh, monitor which framework is the most interesting. Uh, they will monitor Google Trends and the uh, different websites to uh, ensure that uh, technology are supported if people want to use it. So it is still very trendy, and you want to be one of those uh, trendsetter when uh, time comes. So there are, I would say that we're, there are six um, key, contact, key concepts in AngularJS. Um, the first one, it forces you to use an architecture pattern. Um, that means it doesn't force you in an architecture pattern, but it forces you to have an architecture pattern. Um, this uh, will leave you to better code, better code separation, better code organization in your, in your solution, and it will also be way easier to maintain. So you'll be able to use MVC, MVP, or MVVM in any of your AngularJS app. It also uh, enables you to have enhanced HTML templating. Uh, this is something that I loved of the .NET platform. If you're used to ASP.NET or uh, MVC.NET with the Razor platform where you can um, pretty much do your HTML but do your loops in, inside there and um, bind parts of your HTML to uh, repeat tables and all of that, you can also do that in JavaScript with AngularJS, and I will be able to show you that early, uh, uh, later on. There's a concept also that is called a two-way data binding. Two-way data binding is um, something that is very uh, important in AngularJS because you can map your objects in your UI to your uh, to your objects that are in your controllers. You don't have to reach out to any inputs or any values in your UI. 
to get the value and to send it back to the server. Everything is always in sync. So if you change a value in a text box, automatically your model is being updated with that value. This is absolutely amazing uh, feature. You also have a routing engine. And a routing engine means that you'll be able to use AngularJS as the only technology to build your app, because you'll be able to build what they call simple uh, single uh, single page applications. You will be able to have different routes, so, so different URLs that will point you to different resources into your app, and you won't need to have different pages or different uh, or anything else. You will only need to have um, a routing engine in there that will uh, be able to route the user to the, the resource that he's looking for when he puts a new URL in. Um, it also uses dependency injection. So this is a, a very important concept in AngularJS because you can easily swap and easily inject any resource that is available in your uh, in AngularJS app in any controller without the need to, have, to get a reference and all of that. So the dependency injection is also a, a good way to test your code. And that brings me to the unit testing uh, concept, where this is built in the platform. You want to use unit testing to make sure that your code is working and that when you make a change, it still works. That was quite a challenge in SharePoint server-side code. Um, I, I don't think there's a lot of people that had lots of success with unit, unit testing uh, with SharePoint. But today, you can do it with AngularJS. So you don't have to test SharePoint. You will test your own code. You will test your uh, own functions and methods. But you won't have to test SharePoint. And that's a good thing of AngularJS. So that was my wrap-up on AngularJS. And I will show you code um, in a while. So um, we'll be able to see all of those patterns being applied to um, our app that will live in the Office 365 ecosystem. Now we have an AngularJS app with JavaScript and HTML and CSS, but we need a backend. We need something to query, to have data, to be able to show data, to um, have something relevant uh, in your application. And this is, and in, in our case, we will use what they call the Microsoft Graph. So what is the Microsoft Graph? It is a single endpoint for lots of stuff. So um, it is a single endpoint to access data. So you can go, um, in the graph and see what's the data that is around you. So you can see what's the data around me, around any user, what are your messages, what are the con what is the content of your OneDrive, what's the content of your SharePoint files, uh, your OneDrive notes, um, your Excel, your Excel sheet. You can, you can go and ask for pretty much any resource that exists currently in the Office 365 platform. It is also a way for, for you to traverse the data. So it means that you can get a resource and jump from one to the other. A good example is the graph we have uh, as an image in that slide. If you're that user and you want to get to your groups, then you'll be able to step into your files. And from your files, you'll be able to step into the created by uh, object, which is a user. And from that user, you'll be able to see, oh, what are the other files that th this person created? And that other file was modified by someone else. So you can jump from one resource to the other just by specifying different uh, paths in your URL. You don't need to have a, um, everything is, is uh, URL driven. It, it's all REST, it's version. So it's exactly all the cool kids in the valley, I, I like to call them. So all the Twitter and Facebook are using their APIs. Now Microsoft is using exactly the same thing. You can also use it with accessing insights. So you can see what is trending around you. A good example of that is Delve. Delve is a first, a first visualization of the trending around me graph endpoint. So you can see that there are documents, Yammer conversations, links, uh, messages also that are available in the graph, and everything of that is trending around you because it's the most important stuff that exists around you, and it's a good way for you to uh, leverage that data. Um, the graph is a come as you are and get your data. Now there's no technology related to it. I would think that the graph is probably built in .NET, but today we don't really care what is the underlying uh, technology. The only thing we want is to connect and to use the, the uh, APIs over there. So 
you can choose any technology. So you can use .NET, JavaScript, Ruby, Python, PowerShell, uh, AngularJS. And you can develop in any development environment. So you can develop in Xcode, you can develop in Eclipse, you can develop in Visual Studio. Today we'll, we're uh, going to develop in Visual Studio Code. So we can do anything we want. And then we'll connect to what they call an, a Azure AD application through the OpenID Connect and OAuth plot protocols. And this is what will be our um, safeguard before we get to the graph. And then we can, because we'll be authenticated and that we'll have give, uh, given some authorizations to our application, then we'll be able to leverage the graph. And this is how it works. So you can connect with any, any technology, uh, any uh, IDE, and then you just talk with standard um, uh, APIs or uh, protocols to get your data. So I will be showing you um, a bit right now. I will just create a new private window, and then I'll go to the dev.office.com. Uh, on the dev.office.com, you'll be able to see lots of resources. One of the coolest resources is, is the Microsoft Graph. So if you click on the Microsoft Graph here, you'll, you'll be redirected to the uh, graph.microsoft.io. And in here, what is absolutely stunning is that you can try the API. You have a Graph Explorer built in that documentation platform, and that documentation platform will easily help you in getting the data. So here you can see I am, uh, it, it shows me graph.microsoft.com slash v1.0 slash me. So this is the basic uh, URL that you will use. So if you submit it, it will probably tell me that I'm not signed in. So I will just sign in. By signing in, it will redirect you to an Azure AD sign-in application. And we will see later this application, this page, when we'll connect to our own application. So I'm coming here. I'm selecting my username, and then I sign in. And then I can see I'm logged in here as my Office 365 um, account, and then I can sign out. That means also that nobody else can have access to that data uh, besides me, because you need to be logged in. This is what they call the uh, consent. So you will you accept to uh, to be able to use your data in that kind of scenarios. So if I'm going here and I'm, I'm doing submit, so what is going to happen here, I'm going to view a, a, an amazing JSON format where I can see, okay, here is my data uh, that is available in my me portfolio or in my me account. And I can go here and I can say, I want to see my drive. So here I can see, oh, this is my drive, so this is the, the, the large metadata around the drive. Um, you can also see messages. And here you can see that there's plenty of messages. So this is, those are my inbox messages that are available in my Office 365 tenant. And you can see that you have lots of data in there who's from the sender, the recipients, who's the reply to address, what's the subject, what is the body, everything is in there. So you only have one endpoint that you can, uh, you can use. You remember I showed you earlier that the slash me endpoint at that data. What is absolutely amazing is that you can also use the beta endpoint. And those are the upcoming changes that will happen to the graph. So if I'm hitting submit here, oh, I see a lot of more stuff in there. So I can see that the me endpoint in the Microsoft Graph will change in the coming weeks or months because I can see that in the beta endpoint, I have a lot and a lot of new uh, properties that will probably help me in uh, managing my own account. So if I'm going back to the Microsoft Graph documentation, you'll see that there are um, lots of uh, documentation, but both are being referenced. So you can see that the V1.0 reference and the beta reference. So in the V1.0, we have the users in the uh, OneDrive, Excel, Outlook, contacts, calendar, groups, directory, and the webhooks. 
And then the better endpoint, you have tons of stuff. So the OneDrive is there, OneNote, Task with Planner. Um, you have also the webbooks for SharePoint Online. You have Directory, you have Personal Contact. You have lots of those are um, going to be uh, made available in the next coming uh, months. And you can go and you can start to browse for what is a workbook. And everything is documented in there. So feel free to, uh, to leverage the graph by using the Graph Explorer to understand what's the deal behind the graph. Then what is an Azure AD application? And this is our last uh, portion of slides before we get into the code. But Azure AD application is probably the most important concept you need to understand because it's maybe the more complex. Um, it, what is the Azure AD apps is that it can be considered an app in your own Office 365 environment. So um, in the uh, app launcher that you, you always have, you have those apps, Mail, Calendar, People, Yammer, OneDrive. Um, you can also add your own applications in there. And this is what we'll do today. We'll build one that could finish in the app launcher like this one. Um, and it uses to connect uh, to, to the data, it uses standard um, protocols, and the one it's using is the OpenID Connect. So it means that you can connect with any technology to, uh, to that with any Microsoft account. So you can use your business account, or you can use your personal account on your life.com or outlook.com account. Um, and it's, it also supports any authentication mechanism that you put in place. So for example, I am a full cloud user in that in the tenant I showed you, so I'm only having that Office 365 login screen. But if I was a synced user, um, I could use my ADFS connection to be able to connect to the cloud or to the graph. I'll also be able to use multi-factor authentication to be able to connect to the graph. So every authentication mechanism that is used in the uh, Office 365 platforms, you can use them to connect to the graph and to connect to your Azure AD application. Um, when you will, for the first time, hit your, um, your application, you will have what they call a consent screen. And this consent screen will um, give you the ability to see what is going to happen in your app. So here you can see that you, the Microsoft Graph demo needs permission to sign in as you, have full access to your files and files shared with you, have full access to your contacts, have full access to your calendar, read and write access to your email. This means that if you don't accept and you cancel it, every single time you will get there back, it will ask you again. And if you don't accept it, it will never be able to leverage the graph. And that's a good thing because maybe some users don't want, maybe there are privacy issues and you don't want uh, that application to access your data. Um, so this is uh, how the um, authorization is working in there. Um, you always have the full access on your own resources, so this is always a good thing. But we also want to limit the scope of the application. So if we're um, in a, an application where I just want to show you your mails, I won't ask you for complete access to your SharePoint files. Here, if you see that there's something in there that is not good for you or that you don't want to, you can, you can, you can cancel it and then um, don't give access to that application. This set of application is being um, set in an Azure AD application. Um, so I will show you right now that Azure AD application. So let me just uh, bring that up. So I will connect to the old Azure portal. Um, one of the uh, issues we have with um, the Azure AD application platform is that it is not, not yet available in the new portal of Azure. All of that is available in PowerShell, but it's not exactly uh, the, same, uh, the same functions for now. So you need to go in your um, SharePoint and, and your Azure environment where you connected your Azure AD environment and you will you'll find all your different Azure AD in there. 
one of the of, of mine is is the one with my name is my uh, developer tenant in Office 365. So if I'm going there, you see that I can see what are the different users that have access to my stuff. I can see that oh, I only have one, which is ad my admin account. But I also have applications. And those applications are, uh, I would say, proxies to my real data. Here I will show you this one. And this is the one we will use today. So in there, you will have the most important one is the configure tab. And this is where we will add all of our uh, settings to our Azure AD application. So we will set a name. We will also set a sign-on URL. It means from where can I call this uh, Azure AD so it can log me in if I'm not already logged in. So for, for this example, I will be using a local host. I will be running a Node.js web server on my local host and that will be on port 8443, and then I will be able to connect to my Azure AD application. Then I could put in a logo. You can also build multi-tenant app. So it means that you can have an application that sets permissions, uh, sets rules or guidelines of permissions, and then anyone in their own tenant can use it. A great example of that is the Graph Explorer. When I'm logged in as a, uh, a user and I can go pretty much anywhere in that Graph Explorer, um, now I can, it, it's because the application is multi-tenant. Any tenant can connect to it. Nobody in that tenant can read the data, but it allows us to have a centralized application for anyone. So for any ISVs, that is very relevant. Here, there's a bit of magic here. That's, there's the client ID, and that client ID is one of the most important things because we will need to bring that in our AngularJS application. We'll need that client ID because we need to identify on which of the application that is available in the Azure AD uh, application store we want to use, we want to, uh, to leverage, where, what's the data we want to connect to. And then uh, there's some uh, other... Um, Configuration here, single sign-on URL, so what is my uh, unique URI? And here, what is my reply URL? So when I am asking for a resource in Office 365 and I'm not logged in, I will be, I'll go and I'll log in, but they will have to, re to do a reply on, on that URL. So they will do a post back to the URL. When, and once I'm logged in, they will just post it back to my URL, and we need to say what are the URLs that are available for a reply. Um, so in that case, I'm, I'm going back. It means also that you can have two or three or four different URLs. So depending if you want to use that application in multiple environments, in your dev environments, your integration environment, or in your product environment, those can all be there. And when I was talking about permissions, this is where everything happens. So you can go here and add an application. Those applications are all the Microsoft applications. Uh, there's the Graph, Exchange Online, SharePoint Online, Power BI, Scape for Business, Wind, uh, Azure AD. Um, I already selected some, so I will go in here, and I will see what is available in the Graph. So when I click here, I see what are all the permissions that are being uh, made available by the Graph. So but the Graph can read your stuff, view your profile, can read user tasks. But if you want it to, to happen through your application, you need to give explicit Right. So in the case of my application, I check the read user files. And I also check the send mail as a user and the read and write user access to mail. So I will show you an example that I will send uh, and read different emails and that I can read my different user files, which means my OneDrive for business files. And I will also want to sign in and read the user profile. I maybe want to, to gather the username, uh, the first name, the last name, and probably the profile picture. So I want to be able to you to read the user profile. I will also need some SharePoint Online specific dedicated permissions. In that case, I, will, I want to be able to run search queries as a user. So I can search my SharePoint environment. Um, without the need to have a real SharePoint stuff. So you just need to, sh you can run search queries and all of that will always be secured depending on what are your access in that SharePoint environment. And I can also read items in all site collections. So if I have access to an item, I will be able to have access to that item through the uh, that Azure AD application. 
And finally, I will always have that Windows Azure Active Directory so I can um, sign in and read a user profile just for our initial login. So this is a, a, um, an Azure AD application, and this is very important in our case. Um, I will show you quickly uh, one way we can make it happen with AngularJS. If we want to uh, integrate AngularJS with the Microsoft Graph without anything else, there's one little thing that is missing currently. You need to go to your Manage Manifest and download your manifest. This, uh, it, it just because we have a setting that needs to be set and that it's not there by default, and you don't have any way to do it in the UI. So you can just go here, open that file, and this is the manifest of your Azure AD application. So every permission is in there, everything you need, you can see here, this is probably the four uh, graph resources, the two uh, SharePoint Online resources, and the one um, resource for uh, Azure AD, but what is very important here is that you put a true value besides the OAuth to allow implicit flow. This will allow us to have only client side components that will have uh, that will be used in our application. If not, you need to have a server side component. And if I want to use only Angular JS, I don't want to have that kind of um, of behavior. So we'll close that, and then you will just re-upload that file, and then your application will be updated, and you'll be able to uh, use it from AngularJS. So without further ado, I will close this window, because I won't need it anymore. Uh, and now we're up to the demos. So I will show you quickly um, what is, and I close this one, and I will also close this one, because I want to show you the first so, I will go to the to my local, so currently I can show you now, I have an application that is running currently, that is called the Office Up. By the way, all the code I'm showing you today is already public in, the, um, in my GitHub, and I will also sh show you a piece of code that uh, was built by Sahil Malik, um, which is another um, Office 365 MVP, and that is doing an incredible job around Angular, which I wanted to show you both. Um, so I will be able to show you uh, later on. Um, but it's all available uh, in my in my uh, GitHub or in the Sahil's GitHub. And at the end of the session, you will see the resources and all the links uh, will be there. So I can go here. You can see that I want to connect my local host 8443, and then I'm logged in. But I asked for local host, and then I'm being redirected to log in to MicrosoftOnline.com. What's happening here? In fact, my application is uh, brilliant enough to say, hey, I need to be logged in. Any, anything you do in that, in that application needs to be logged in. So when you, you, you're, you're getting in, I need that resource. I need that token. Everything is token-based. I need that token to be able to use it and to send it to the Microsoft Graph to show him that I am authenticated. Okay. I will ask you to go to your uh, Office 365 authentication portal, which is this one, and then when Office 365 will give me the token back, we'll be good. So I will go here, I will sign in, and then I'm now logged in. And you can see I'm logged in um, because you can see my face at the top. And that face is coming from the Microsoft Graph. So it means that it's, it's just uh, a way for us to use resources everywhere. Picture, uh, picture is, is a good example. So I will show you different uh, tabs, and then we'll go into the code and see how it's built. So you can see here I'm using the Office UI Fabric, um, which is the new Office UI framework uh, for you to use if you want to uh, integrate yourself in the Office world. So it really looks like SharePoint or any Office add-ins. Um, you can go and you can see the messages. So here, what's happening here, I have a, a um, UI that gives me all of my messages uh, in there. So I can see that I have some Office 365 uh, information about moving your Office 365 data to the Canada Data Center region or any other uh, emails. I can also send an email. So I will send an email.
And I will say hello, SPC. And then I will just send that email. So I will wait for a bit and this will appear here. And I can also come here and read an email. So what's up Toronto? Uh, hello everyone, that was the email I sent about that. And now my hello ESPC came in and I can go here and I can, uh, I can say I had an email. And I also can say that because I clicked on it, I marked the email as red. So now it's not blue anymore, and this is all happening in the grass. This is happening in the real live data of the Office 365 platform. I can also do something uh, quite similar, but in the files. So here I can say I have all of my files that are being shown here, and I have my mockups, and there's a folder, so I want to get into my folder, um, and then I can see that I have some files, and I, I could be able to uh, click on that Excel tour file, it will bring me to my SharePoint environment, it will show me my Excel online, and this is my file. So it's uh, amazing how easy it is to integrate ourselves with anything related to the uh, Office 365 platform from the Graph API. Last thing I want to show you is the Videos tab. And here it's probably, and I will just go in here and make sure there's a little bug in the uh, Office 365 um, video portal where um, you need to run the video portal before you can generate any thumbnail. And this is, what, this is what I'm doing here. So now I'm just generating all those videos in here, all those thumbnails, and I will be able to get to come here and to refresh my videos. And now everything will be shown. So here I can, you can see I'm using pretty much the same UI that a video is using. Uh, but with my own data. This is all something that is built in AngularJS. So how is that done? First of all, there's some groundwork that needs to be done. We need to make sure that we can connect to the Microsoft Graph from the AngularJS platform. So here's the code. We start everything with a index.html. So this is how AngularJS works. We, you only have one single page in there. It's a single page application. Um, so you come here, and you can see that there's nothing very interesting in here. Some um, are references to the, the, fabric, the fabric components, the fabric uh, CSS for the Office UI fabric. Here I will have a gulp task that will build my CSS for me. So if I have multiple CSS files or only one, when I build my application, it will replace that by my uh, specific CSS environment. And here I have my app, and this is, this is the only HTML that is being used in my index.html. So I can see here I have a div, I have a UI view, I don't know what's that, name, sweet bar, I don't know what's that. In fact, I know what is that. This is a way for us to tell AngularJS, I will want to, to display here a specific view that is called sweet bar. And here I will want to call it navigation, and here will be my header, and here will be my container, and my container will have dynamic views. So when I'm going back to my office up here, when I click on messages, you can see that my URL changes, and that I am in, in, in another view, but my top, so my sweet bar and my navigation, they haven't changed. So that controller here, or that huge container zone, is uh, dynamic based on the routing. And then at the end, we have all of the uh, JavaScript resources we're using. So we're using jQuery, Bootstrap, Angular, Angular UI Router. So I'm, I'm using the Angular UI Router instead of the Angular Router um, for uh, routing uh, as a routing engine. Um, this means that uh, we have more power when we're using that router. I'm also using something called the Azure Active Directory Authentication Libraries. So I'm using the adal.min.js, and I'm also using the adal angular.min.js. And this is where all the magic happens. This is because of those two files that I'm able to connect to the Microsoft Graph without pretty much anything to do in my code. And then I have other JS files. Um, and I'm also using the NGUI Office UI Fabric, so it's the Angular JS implementation of the Office UI Fabric. This is also done by uh, two of our uh, fellow MVP colleagues, uh, Andrew Connell and Waldeck Mastercars. Um, 
that are doing an incredible job in integrating the Office UI Fabric in the AngularJS world. So back to our code, uh, we want to understand what is happening here. How can we have that adult and that adult Angular thing running, and how can we say, hey, I want to connect to my own Azure uh, AD application? So this is uh, happening in my index.config. Um, this is a way for us to configure on runtime my AngularJS application. So here, what I'm doing here, I'm just using that regular function, config. This is a very uh, standard stuff in uh, AngularJS. Every application usually starts with a config file or a config method that allows us to add configuration dynamically to our app. And I am injecting with dependency injection my log provider, my HTTP provider, and my ADAL authentication service provider. And this is what I'm doing here. I'm configuring my ADAL authentication service provider to init. So what are the init values I want to send it? That client ID. Remember the client ID that was in that Azure AD application? This is what goes here. Then what is the tenant I want to connect to? If you're using a multi tenant environment, you don't need to connect any to use anything, you just need to use common. But in our case, I want to connect to my own tenant, which is this one. Then what is the logout URL? When I log in uh, when I'm logging out, what is the what is the URL I want to use? And what are the endpoints that I will use in the Azure AD uh, world? I will use the graph.microsoft.com and I will use SharePoint.com. So parts of it are coming from SharePoint and parts of it are coming from the graph. And that's the only thing I need to do. From now on, what will happen is that every time I am asking for a resource in the Microsoft Graph, the um, ADAL platform will take care of everything for me. So if I'm not logged in, I will be redirected. I will log in. And then a token will be uh, shipped by the URL to my application. That token will be gathered by the ADAL platform. By adding that in my ADAL platform, I will then be able to use that ADAL uh, token and to inject it in every single call. So if we're looking at that ADAL Angular uh, JavaScript file, and I'll come here, and I'll see. I don't want to add the minified version of it. And I just want to, and this is where everything is happening. This is the, the magic around that uh, ADAL Angular stuff. You can see here, and I'm, I'm just going fast in that, quickly in that logic, because you don't really have to care, but I, I, I want you to understand what is happening. It gets a cache token that was uh, delivered by Office 365 when you were logging in. And then if there's a token, the only thing that they will do, they will add that token to a bearer uh, authorization either into your, uh, in every HTTP request you're doing. And so it's taken care for you. If not, it will probably just uh, log in you. And then uh, when it's done, when you, you were able to get your token from that login screen, it will add it and then load the resource. So it's the only thing you need to understand to integrate yourself with the Office 365 platform. Then we have some routes. And I want to show you like the message routes. Um, this is regular uh, Angular stuff. So I have a URL. What is my container? Uh, what is the view I want to put in? What is the, the controller I want to use? What is some really specific Angular stuff? But here, this is where the magic happens. I require an AD login to be able to connect to that route. So you won't be able to get to that slash messages route without having a login. So if you're not logged in, automatically uh, AngularJS will be able to redirect you to that Office 365 login, going back, store the token, use the token, inject the token in your query, and then you're good. So let's look at one of the queries we're using when we're doing messages. So I'll go into my inbox controller, and I will just show you here. Okay. So I have a, a, a um, method called 
get next messages. That get messages allows you to call a message service, and this is where uh, all the API will be done. So I'm getting the messages once it's done, then just push my different messages into my, my, my uh, array of messages, and then my UI would al al automatically be updated with each and every one of the messages that are available in my um, data that is coming back from my server. But how did I call my data? It's by the message services. So here I have get messages. So what I'm doing here, I'm creating a different object. So it's very important here, you need to have a different object. Everything needs to be promise-based so you don't have any async calls that are happening every time and that it's become like spaghetti code. And then I'm building a URI. I'm building my URI to my graph uh, application. So graph.microsoft.com slash v1.0 slash me slash mail folder slash inbox slash messages. And then I'm loading only the 10 first messages. And then I'm doing an HTTP get of that resource. I haven't put any token in there. It is the underlying ADAL Angular that will take care of when I'm doing that get to inject the right tokens. When there's a success, so when everything happens and it's good and I have data, I'm just resolving the data. And this is what I have in my then folder here. This is what is happening here. So the data is now available. I can use it. Then I want to connect that, that data to my, to, my, uh, to my UI. So this is where everything happens. I have what they call a, uh, I'm, I'm using an infinite scroll, so every time I'm, I'm, I'm scrolling, I will get the next messages. But here, I am only doing a ng repeat, data ng repeat. So it means that I will be able to loop in every message that are available in my messages array that is that is uh, that was set in my controller. So for every single message, I will repeat that section here. That section I will be able to use those brackets, those curly braces to show the data. So I'll, I'll, I'll get my data dot sender dot email address dot name, message dot subject, message dot body preview, message dot receive date time, and I'll also be able to um, connect with another function. So when I will click on the on the name, I will go to the message, so it will redirect me to the actual message. I will be able also to delete a message or to toggle a read status on a message because I'm clicking on something. So this is how we can integrate the data from Office 365 to a, a messages on my UI. So when I'm going back here, I'm showing you, when I'm clicking on it, it will automatically load the controller. Controller will call the service. Service will call the Microsoft Graph. Data will be coming back. Data will be brought to my service. Service will send the data to my controller. The controller will assign the data in my, uh, it, it will assign itself as data, and then the view will be able to get the data from the controller and then show, um, and then show it right here. So we can now be able to uh, use the um, this application. You're free to download that simple uh, on my GitHub environment, so uh, feel free to download it and to edit it if you want. I will take any pull requests um, that I find that are useful, and you'll be able to, to learn JavaScript, HTML, Angular, and the Microsoft Graph very easily, because this is something that we're used to. Uh, this is something that we will do in a SharePoint environment. A good example is the videos. This is exactly SharePoint uh, APIs, but you want to be able to uh, bring your skills a bit further than it is uh, right now. The last thing that I want to show you is once you're good with AngularJS, you will know that there are some ways that you can also enhance that AngularJS environment or your skills. You'll be able from a day where you didn't know anything about AngularJS to a day where you can build web application and then that you can also build a mobile application because there's a framework called Ionic that you can build everything in AngularJS, and then it is now a native mobile application. They brought also that concept to something new, to desktop applications. So there's a technology called 
electron. This is what I want to show you here. And this is the Sion Malik's example. Um, I'm using the uh, Angular 2 here. I will show you the code quickly right after that. Here, I want to be able to authenticate. So this is a Windows application that can run on Linux, on Mac, and on PC. So now I'm on PC. And here, I can go in and sign it. So I can go here, and then I have a native pop-up. And then I will be able to put in my password. I hope that I will. And then I'm still in a, in a in a Windows app, and then oh something happened. Oh, I see my username now, so I'm in, I'm probably connected. I will go see my files. You can see here I see my files, and then I will get my files. So it will do a, a call to my Office 365 tenant uh, through the Microsoft Graph, and I will be able to show the data. So now by leveraging your own Angular JS skills. You can now build web applications, mobile applications, and now desktop applications. So those skills are very relevant and will still be uh, around the corner for, the, for um, a couple of years. So I think it's worth, it's worth it to go in the uh, Office 365 um, platform with that kind of technology. So we'll just stop that application, and I will just show you the code quickly. Um, and here, Everything is happening here. So when you're logging in, what is happening here, I will be uh, getting my, so this is a, an Angular 2 app. We'll just pop that. Um, and when I log in, I will authenticate, and then I will store that access token. I will get the token, and at the end, I will be able to, um, where is that? To, I don't know why it removes it. Uh, it, it was set to night, exactly, that's what I was looking for. So it gets the exact same way. This is a, a bit more cryptic because there's no ADAL for uh, Angular 2 yet, but it's exactly the same thing that the ADAL Angular was doing. So it will set the item, get that access token, and it will set it in, in local storage in your window. This is all web-based, even if it's no, in a, uh, um, a not a web browser, but a an application, a Windows application. And when I want to get to my files, the only thing I will have to do here is I will do my get on my recent drive files, and then I will get files, and I will just assign them. So the exact same way I'm doing it in Office 3, in uh, Anchor JS one, I'm pretty much doing also then in the uh, Office uh, Angular JS two or Angular two. When I'm doing the get, this is where uh, it happens. We're creating the authorization header. So we're getting this get access token we'll get, that we'll get in the local storage. That access token will add it to the authorization header. Then when I will be doing my get, I will append those headers and then everything will happen. So without a lot of logic, when you're done uh, putting in place your like underlying infrastructure for authentication, you're done. You're good, and you don't have anything to worry. Um, you just need to code your application in the um, in the Angular JS pattern, and then you're good to go. Before I leave you, um, you can check all the all the resources here. Um, those are, I would say, the main resources for anything Angular JS and the Microsoft Graphs. So there's dev.office.com. Uh, we also have the graph.microsoft.io github.com slash office desk. So there's a lot of uh, simple applications there that will help you. There's a Microsoft Graph GitHub where you have Microsoft Graph specific um, samples. My GitHub, Rich Diz or Richard Dizariga, that has also a, um, an amazing GitHub repo on everything around the Office 365 platform and the Microsoft Graph. And the code uh, I just showed you with uh, Sayel Malik uh, for the Electron one. Uh, for Richard Desariga, there's also an example on Ionic on the Ionic platform. So if you want to use um, a iPhone or Android development, you can use it with the Ionic platform. Um, I will now be ready for questions. Uh, if you have, uh, feel free to ask them in the question box. 
and um, I will be able to uh, answer those questions. Thank you, Sebastian. Yeah, that was great. I have some questions here for you, and the first one is, what is the difference from Node.js? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, in fact, Node.js is a server-side uh, JavaScript environment. So you can write, you can totally create a web server in, in JavaScript with Node.js, and you can, or you can do pretty much anything you want with Node.js. AngularJS is a framework, uh, a JavaScript framework for web development. So it's it's only it's mainly for web, and then Node.js is mainly for server-side uh, environment. But the cool thing is that if you learn JavaScript and, and AngularJS, you already know uh, a good part of Node.js because Node.js is just JavaScript in the server. So everything you learn, the way it works, promises, the syntax, everything, this sticks for Node.js also. Okay. Which Angular version to use, 1.0 or 2.0, or do we need to learn both? Is 2.0 covered or does 2.0 cover 1.0 as well? Um, good question. Um, Angular 1.x, I'll say 1.x because now we're at 1.5, I think. Um, those are two different frameworks. Uh, Angular 2 was a complete rewrite of Angular 1. Um, but all the uh, paradigms, all the concepts that are existing in Angular 1 are still there in Angular 2. Um, the, I would say the biggest challenge in Angular 2 is not the, uh, the is not concept-wise. It's probably language language-wise. Uh, Angular 2 is using natively TypeScript. So instead of writing JavaScript, you will write TypeScript. TypeScript, which is a super set of JavaScript to be able to have a bit more, I, I would say, quality code um, in your environment. You still can do it in JavaScript, but it's a, it's very painful to do it in, in JavaScript now. Um, do you learn both? I would say um, if you need to start something new today, um, I would be more comfortable to go with one point something uh, before going to Angular 2 because Angular 2 is not yet um, uh, GA. So it's not, it, it, we're still in release candidates or beta. So it, it, it's still a bit, it's still moving. It's less moving than it was before. Uh, but um, in, the, in the coming year, I would say start looking at Angu uh, seriously at Angular 2. Um, so I would say your first Hello World, do it in AngularJS. Your first big app, AngularJS, but then start looking uh, at the at his big brother, Angular2, and start uh, thinking about it. On the Angular2 side, it does not cover Angular1, but it uses the same um, the same versions, the same concept, sorry. So you, you cannot just go and change it, the... Um, the version of your Angular JavaScript file to two, and that everything will work. Well, you'll need to migrate part of this stuff uh, to Angular 2. Okay, we're nearly out of time, so here's the last question. And would it be okay to send you the question, Sebastian, and maybe you could email me back answers and we could post a Absol blog? Ab absolutely, absolutely, I will. Brilliant, okay, great. So here's the last question, and we'll deal with all the other questions uh, at a later time. Is Microsoft Graph coming as free with Office 365, or do you need to purchase the license? Very good question. It is free and will always be. Um, so it is, um, it, depending on what are the services you're using in Office 365, um, you won't have access to the resource you're not paying for. So, for example, if you're only using uh, your exchange online, you won't have access to SharePoint and your OneDrive. But if you're using the Office 365 platform as a whole, the Microsoft Graph API is totally free. You don't have to pay for, for anything there. It is just a new way for you to consume the data. Um, and it will always be free because those, this is how, for example, Delve is built on top of the Microsoft Graph. Um, the newest uh, SharePoint framework will be built on top of the Microsoft Graph. So there won't be anything that will stop you from using that Microsoft Graph API. It's only the resources that you're um, talking to that needs to that, that you need to pay for. But this is included in your Office 365 uh, subscription, uh, depending on what the type of your subscription you have. So I know it's available on all the uh, small and medium small and medium businesses, and also on the enterprise, so E1 to E5. Um, it's available also on a single product. Um, and that's pretty much it. So it's, it's free and it's amazing. So it is really a technology to look for and to try to integrate your own office space with that API. 
Sebastian, thank you so much for your time uh, today. Your webinar is fantastic. And my apologies to everyone else uh, with all the questions, but we will follow them up. Okay, um, that is it for today. For more top quality training from the world's best speakers, look no further than Vienna for the European SharePoint Conference. See sharepointeurope.com for full details. Uh, join us for our next webinar on Tuesday, August 23rd for Power Apps with SharePoint Deep Dive. Thank you and goodbye.